In this lecture, we will talk about uh, the thermodynamic scale of temperature and finally, uh, derive an expression for the efficiency of the Carnot engine. Okay. Uh, we start by illustrating the um, uh, Carnot cycle uh, on a PV diagram like this. Although um, we used a slightly different illustration earlier, you may recall that you know we used an illustration like this uh, to show more reversible adiabats and isotherms. You know we, we sort of show it schematically in this uh, in this manner. So each one of the blue line is a reversible isotherm, and the red lines are all reversible adiabats. So Carnot engine will operate between two. Uh, reversible adiabats and two reversible isotherms. For instance, uh, we may have a, a Carnot engine that starts here and then goes along this, uh, let us say goes up to there and then comes down like this, uh, maybe like this and then maybe like this. So, this would be a Carnot cycle operating between uh, the isotherms T A and T B and these two uh, reversible adiabats. Now, what we want to show here uh, is the following. The efficiency of the Carnot engine when it operates in a cycle is 1 minus Qc over Qh and we want to show that this depends only on the reservoir temperatures. Okay. So, we um, demonstrate it in the following manner. So, we take uh, this cycle, some amount of heat Qh is uh, supplied during this cycle and some amount of heat Qc is rejected during this cycle. Now, uh, you can easily imagine operating a Carnot cycle which is just shifted between these two uh, reversible adiabats, but between the same two isotherms. Okay. So, in that case, uh, the Carnot cycle would look uh, uh, something like this. Let us, okay. So, in that case, the Carnot cycle would look something like this. And uh, notice that there would be no difference between uh, this Carnot cycle and this Carnot cycle. The um, uh, heat that is um, uh, supplied will still be QH and the heat that is rejected will still be QC. Okay. So, I can move it as long as I uh, maintain the spacing between the two reversible area, uh, adiabats. I can move this cycle, slide this cycle along this isotherm and the amount of heat supplied and the amount of heat rejected will remain the same. Only the state points will change. On the other hand, if I actually try to uh, move the uh, cycle, slide the cycle vertically down. Let us see what happens if I slide the cycle vertically down. So, I do something like this. Now, uh, you can easily see that this cycle will be different from the original one in terms of heat interaction because now the heat supplied is QC. What was the heat rejected in the previous cycle is now the heat supplied and you should remember that uh, QC is less than QH. Okay? Now, this will reject a different amount of heat QC prime which would be less than uh, QC. As we slide down the reversible adiabat and go from one isotherm to another, the heat interaction decreases. So, QH is greater than QC, which is greater than QC prime. So, you can see that the cycles are different now, whereas if I slide along a reversible isotherm, cycle remains the same. The heat interaction remains the same, only the state points change. But when I slide down the uh, reversible adiabat from one isotherm to another, the heat interaction changes, which tells me that the heat interaction or 1 minus QC over QH is a function only of the reservoir temperature. So, only when I slide down the reversible adiabat from one reversible isotherm to another, the heat interaction and other things in the cycle change. Okay? So, this tells me that the efficiency of the cycle is dependent only on the reservoir temperatures. Okay? So, it makes it clear that it is dependent only on the reservoir temperatures. So, QC over QH, the uh, efficiency itself is a function psi, some unknown function psi of the reservoir temperature TH and TC. So, QC over QH may be written as some unknown function phi of TH, comma TC. That is the most important point. So, you know that the, uh, the ratio of QC over QH is, uh, is a function only of the reservoir temperatures. In fact, even if you look at the cycle, uh, you can see that there is nothing else that the efficiency can depend on. The only the reservoir temperatures are available for us to adjust. So, it should be clear that the efficiency will depend only on the reservoir temperatures, but this illustration uh, brings it out even more clearly. Okay? Now, uh, how do we make use of this information? 
Oh, so, here is what we do. I have engine 1 and which operates between reservoirs T A and T C. So, T A is greater than T C. So, there is also an intermediate reservoir. So, let us write it like this. Okay. So, T A is the hot reservoir, T C is a cold reservoir. Engine 1 operates between T A and T C. It is given an amount of heat Q H 1 from the hot reservoir and it produces an amount of work equal to W 1. <coughs> Now, uh, I construct another uh, device which is composed of two uh, uh, reversible engines 2 and 3. Okay. So, this is the device that I am constructing. So, I can enclose this as a new device. So, that consists of two reversible engines. Engine 2 receives the same amount of heat from the high temperature reservoir as engine 1 and produces certain amount of work. It rejects an amount of heat Q C 2 to this reservoir at uh, an intermediate temperature T B. Okay. Engine 3 picks up Q H 3 from this reservoir and then rejects an amount of heat Q C 3 to the cold reservoir at T C. Okay. So, I have added one more intermediate reservoir and these two reverse engines operate between these two reservoirs. Okay. So, let us go ahead. So, Q C 1 over Q H 1 is a function only of the reservoirs that this engine operates between which is T A and T C. Q C 2 is again a function only of the two reservoirs between which engine 2 operates and those are A and B and Q C 3 similarly is a function only of T B and T C. Now, notice that Q H 2 and Q H 1 are equal. So, Q H 2 and Q H 1 are equal. So, let us just uh, erase this for now. So, Q H 2 and Q H 1 are equal because otherwise the comparison would be unfair. So, we need to give the same amount of heat to the two engines from the same reservoir. Only then the comparison is fair. So, Q H 2 equal to Q H 1. Q C 3 is equal to Q C 1. Let us see why this is. Q C 3 which is this one here is equal to Q C 1. Why does this have to be true? Because if Q C 1 is different from Q C 3 then the efficiencies of the two engines will be different. They are both given the same amount of heat from this reservoir and if the amount of heat rejected to this reservoir is different then efficiency of one engine will be different from the efficiency of the other engine. And we have already established that the efficiency of all reversible engines operating between the same reservoirs is the same. So, for that reason and since Q H 1 is equal to Q H 2, Q C 1 must be equal to Q C 3. Okay? So, that is what we have written here and Q H 3 equal to Q C 2. Okay? So, Q H 3 is equal to Q C 2. This is because we want this reservoir to operate in a cycle. Remember, we want the entire device to operate in a cycle. If during each cycle, we reject a certain amount of heat to this reservoir and we uh, pick up a different amount of heat from the reservoir, then this reservoir will not actually operate in a cycle. So, how much ever we reject to the reservoir is what we should actually pick up from this reservoir during each cycle. So, that the amount of heat rejected and the amount of heat supplied by the reservoir remains the same and so the reservoir operates in a cycle. Okay. So, for that reason we uh, insist that these two should be equal to each other. So, with these constraints <coughs> I can write the following Q C 1 or Q H 1 may be written as the product of these two quantities. So, this is dependent only on T A and T C. This is dependent only on T B and T C and this ratio is dependent only on T A and T B. Now, this relationship can be satisfied if and only if this function phi, unknown function phi is of this form xc of T C divided by xc of T H where xc is again as yet unknown function. So, this is also an unknown function, but now uh, the functional form or de functional dependence of the reservoir temperature becomes clear. So, it has to be something like this x c of T c divided by x c of T h. Of course, you must bear in mind that Q c is less than Q h. That means, as the uh, reservoir temperature decreases, 
the heat interaction also decreases provided we are traveling uh, between the same two uh, reversible adiabats provided we are sliding down between the same two reversible adiabats. So, as the reservoir temperature decreases the heat interaction also decreases ok. So, <coughs> we, uh, we have put uh, Xc of Tc in the numerator Xc of Th in the denominator to satisfy this constraint because you may also write this as Xc of Th divided by Xc of Tc and this relationship will still be satisfied, but that would not be consistent with what we just outlined that the heat interaction decreases with decreasing reservoir temperature. So, this is the correct form. There are many many functions which will uh, satisfy uh, this sort of a relationship. Lord Kelvin initially proposed Xc of T to be E raised to T and T could then vary from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, supposedly, he uh, did not feel that this was aesthetic, he did not like the fact that temperature could be negative, he really did not want uh, temperatures to be negative uh, in this scale. So, he discarded uh, E raised to T and he came up with an even more uh, simple form which is simply that Xc of T is equal to T. And he said that in this uh, scale, the temperatures will go from 0 to infinity, they will not be negative, they will go from 0 to infinity. Now, this scale of temperature has come to be known as the Kelvin absolute or the thermodynamic scale of temperatures. So, Xc of T is equal to T, which means that uh, Qc over Qh may then be written as Tc over Th, right. So, uh, Qc over Qh may then be written as Tc over Th. The only um, issue that is uh, left unresolved is it is ok to have a new scale like this and then insist that the temperature in this scale should go from 0 to infinity. But how do we relate the values to existing scales? So, by this uh, by the time this was proposed there are already uh, Fahrenheit and centigrade scales ok. Uh, you know that in the centigrade scale water freezes at uh, 0 degree Celsius or water boils at 100 degree Celsius at one atmosphere. So, that is a specific number. How do we come up with the number for this for temperatures in this scale? This means, we have to relate the Kelvin scale to the other scales in order to come up with the number. Now, here also um, the ingenuity of uh, Kelvin comes to the fore, ok. Let us uh, just quickly go back and uh, refresh our memory about what we uh, said about um, uh, gas thermometers. So, let us uh, go up to gas thermometers. Okay. So, you may recall that uh, we discussed this in uh, some detail. So, let us just quickly refresh this. So, there is a bulb which contains a bulb uh, which contains a certain amount of gas up to the uh, level of the mercury. So, initially we fill the bulb with some gas say O2 and uh, measure the pressure by adjusting the sliding scale ok. And then we remove a certain amount of gas keeping it the same O2. We again take the reading. We keep doing this for smaller and smaller amounts of gas. Then we change uh, from O2 to N2, repeat the readings again, maybe go to uh, a third gas helium or neon and repeat the same experiment and measure the pressure, ok. Now, ok, so now let us see what these uh, readings look like. If you plot the readings on a pressure versus time scale, so this could be for instance uh, O2, uh, this could be N2, uh, this could be say uh, neon and uh, each one of this dot corresponds to a different amount of mass uh, in the bulb ok. So, we have different amounts of uh, gas in the bulb. So, each one of this reading refers to that. Note that pressure here is proportional to temperature because <coughs> it is an ideal gas and PV is equal to m times r times t and it is a constant volume thermometer. So, V is a constant. So, as I reduce my uh, m, the temperature of the, uh, of the uh, reservoir whose temperature um, the reservoir whose temperature is to be measured that uh, temperature remains constant 
ok. So, T remains constant. So, you can see that uh, as I keep going down you know the uh, as I keep reducing the mass the pressure value keeps going down ok. And what was interesting about this uh, plot or is the following these are very very accurate uh, temperature measurements using constant volume gas thermometer. As we mentioned earlier constant volume gas thermometer probably uh, comes closest to being a thermometer whose readings or independent of the working substance meaning O2, N2 or neon. Still they must behave as an ideal gas, but it is probably the most accurate thermometer that can be fabricated. What was interesting about this was that you know the uh, all these uh, readings for a particular gas uh, fall on a straight line and uh, if the straight lines corresponding to different gases are all uh, extended up to the x axis which is the temperature axis they all uh, intersect at the same point ok and that is at a temperature of minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Of course, this corresponds to 0 pressure because the y axis is on the uh, because pressure is on the y axis. So, they all seem to uh, intersect at minus 273.15 at 0 pressure. So, Lord Kelvin then asserted that a temperature of uh, I mean uh, he asserted that minus 273.15 was the lowest possible temperature that can be achieved. In fact, he said that this is the lowest possible temperature in the entire universe minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Even in the outermost space where we have a high degree of vacuum, he said this is the uh, lowest temperature that can be achieved because this corresponded to P equal to 0. The thinking was that uh, outer space once you go far beyond it is um, uh, as close to being absolute vacuum as possible. So, this must be the lowest possible temperature that can be achieved. So, he then asserted that a temperature of 0 Kelvin corresponds to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. Notice that there was no evidence at all for any of these assertions it was just uh, uh, probably an educated guess based on whatever was known at that time. And uh, the interesting aspect is that this assertion that 0 Kelvin corresponds to this has withstood the test of time that is probably what is most remarkable. So, what comes out of the analysis is a new temperature scale and also uh, connection between the new temperature scale namely the Kelvin scale and the uh, existing scales that 0 Kelvin corresponds to minus 273.15 degree Celsius. So, the efficiency of the Carnot engine may now be written as 1 minus uh, T c over T h. Of course, a temperature of 0 Kelvin is not attainable because if you can attain 0 Kelvin, then the efficiency of the Carnot engine will be 100 percent, which would be in violation of the Kelvin Planck statement. Okay. The lowest temperature that has been uh, realized so far is uh, 500 pico Kelvin by a team of scientists from MIT. Okay. Now, so, in order to uh, have an efficiency of 100 percent, we require uh, a temperature of 0 Kelvin or we require a reservoir at a low uh, cold reservoir at a temperature of 0 Kelvin. Okay. Now, let us just uh, go back to the illustration of the Corno engine that we had. Okay. So, here we have a Corno engine. Now, let us look at uh, process uh, 2 3. Process 2 3 is reversible adiabatic expansion when the uh, cylinder has been taken from the high temperature reservoir and kept on this insulated stand and it continues to expand until the temperature reaches T c as we said before. So, the expansion continues until it reaches the temperature of the cold reservoir. Now, let us say that the cold reservoir temperature is 0 Kelvin. So, this 2 3 as you can imagine uh, for a temperature in order in order for this process to reach a temperature of 0 Kelvin, you can easily imagine that it will keep going like this and eventually it will asymptote and it will never be able to reach a temperature of 0 Kelvin, number 1. Number 2, for it to actually uh, reach a temperature of 0 Kelvin, the cylinder length must be infinite. A cylinder has to be infinitely long for you to actually expand this until it reaches a temperature of 0 Kelvin, both of which are not feasible. 
So, this shows uh, this argument that I am giving here is actually put forth by uh, Peter Atkins and it is a very uh, interesting argument or very different way to look at this that both these things suggest that attaining a temperature of 0 Kelvin is not possible. So, in the same manner we can write for a refrigerator, Carnot refrigerator, uh, the COP being 1 over TH over TC minus 1 and for a Carnot heat pump we may write the COP like this. So, we may uh, finally answer the question that we posed earlier, what is the maximum possible efficiency of a direct engine or maximum possible COP of a reverse engine. Now, we can actually give some numbers. Let us say that we have a thermal power plant which uses the Rankine cycle let us say operating between uh, high temperature of uh, 1200 Kelvin and rejecting heat to the ambient at 300 Kelvin. Now, I can plug in these values, these temperatures into this expression and then see that the efficiency of such a power plant cannot be more than 75 percent. So, Kelvin Planck statement said that the efficiency of such a plant cannot be 100 percent. So, we were then speculating whether it could be 95, 90, 85, 80 and so on. Now, it turns out that it can only be 75 and um, uh, modern power plants which use for example, something like an ultra supercritical cycle which is a variant of the basic Rankine cycle are able to attain efficiencies between 55 and 60 percent. So, you can see that the efficiencies of actual existing power plants have come uh, quite close to the Carnot efficiency itself. Okay. So, now we can finally calculate a number. So, if you tell me what the reservoir temperatures are, then we can actually calculate the efficiency. In the same manner, let us say that we have a domestic refrigerator that is operating between minus 10 degrees Celsius and the ambient at 30 degrees Celsius. Okay. We can see that the COP of this refrigerator cannot be more than 6.575. Clausius statement says the COP cannot be infinity. But now, we can see how what the real numbers are like. So, real number is even for a Carnot engine which itself is a theoretical construct can only be 6.575. So, that is what I uh, alluded to in the beginning of uh, our discussion on second law. Not only will second law tell you what it cannot be, it will also tell you what it can be. So, now you appreciate the difference between the two. Kelvin Planck statement says that it cannot be 100 percent, Clausius statement says it cannot be infinity. Now, based on uh, our discussion of the Carnot engine, we now know what it can be. For example, in this case, the efficiency of the direct engine is 75 percent, efficiency of this refrigerator is 6.575, which are far from 100 percent and infinity. So, second law answers both these questions very, very nicely. That is probably one of the most important and fundamental uh, contributions of second law to the field of uh, mechanical engineering and indeed thermodynamics. Now, there are some interesting aspects of uh, the Carnot engine even though it is a theoretical construct. Notice that the efficiency of a Carnot engine. So, this is the efficiency of any engine this expression holds for any engine that operates in a cycle. This expression holds only for a Carnot engine. Now, if you look at this expression, notice that it depends only on the reservoir temperatures and does not depend on the nature of the working substance. The working substance inside can be anything. As long as it is a pure substance, we should be all right. So, it can be anything. So, the uh, efficiency of the Carnot engine depends only on the reservoir temperatures and not on the nature of the working substance, which means that if I actually uh, uh, run a Carnot engine, let us say, um, let us go back to this illustration. I am sorry. So, let us say that 
um, uh, we run the uh, uh, we run a Corno engine between two reservoirs. Let us say that um, the temperature of this reservoir is not known. but the temperature of the uh, cold reservoir is known. So, Tc is known, Th is not known that is the temperature that we wish to measure. So, we, uh, we, uh, we measure the amount of heat in principle, we measure the amount of heat that is supplied to the engine, we can determine the work that the engine produces as it executes a cyclic process and then determine the efficiency of the engine. So, basically what we are doing is we are operating the uh, Corno engine between two reservoirs, one whose temperature is not known, other one whose temperature is known. Okay. So, we measure QH and by measuring the work that the uh, engine puts out per cycle, we know QC. So, we know the efficiency of the engine. Now, we know one of these temperatures. So, the other temperature can be evaluated and the value that we get is independent of the working substance. So, the Corno engine actually is the only uh, thermometer which, uh, which can actually give uh, readings which are independent of the working substance at least in principle, at least in principle that is uh, very, very important to know. 